On this flyover, we saw steel rings being stacked near a bunch of tents. Yes, really, but not by who you think. Hey everybody, this is Thomas Burkhardt for NASA Space Flight. Steven and Michael joined me for another flight over Cape Canaveral this week, so let's dive into the latest from the Space Coast. But first, thanks to Space Flight Simulator for sponsoring this video. More on them later. To start, let's check out what SpaceX has been up to at Roberts Road and their launch and landing pads. What's going on, Sawyer? Quite a lot, Thomas. Let's start over at Roberts Road and work our way around the Cape. While we're not seeing any new tower segments, which isn't a bad thing since we don't even know where these are going to go, there are some noticeable changes. The floors that we had mentioned in the past flyover for levels 1, 4, and 5 are now receiving the panels for making, well, the actual floor. If you need a refresher, on the last flyover, we labeled all of the segments so you know where each one of these is going to go on the stack. But I'll highlight a few of them here right now. It seems like the floor on level 1 is complete, while the one on level 4 is about halfway done. Of the two floors on level 5, the one at the bottom seems complete, and the one at the top seems to only be missing a few panels of flooring. The slow pace of construction for these tower segments could just be simply because they don't have anywhere else to put this tower. While we don't know its final destination, we do know that it is not for the crew access tower at Slick 40, and certainly not for any catch-only tower. Scooting over just a bit, the chopsticks have been flipped over to install their shoulder. We saw them building the main part of the arm on the last flyover, and now it's time for part two. This is the part of the arm that is attached to the carriage system. Once these shoulders are installed, they will flip the arms again to install the hardware for stacking and catching starships and super heavy boosters. Boy, they're gonna need rotator cuff surgery with how much they're flipping these shoulders. Oh brother, this guy stinks! The main structure of the carriage system has now been put in place. This is the system that allows the chopsticks to meet with the tower. One side of the carriage system is where the chopsticks are installed, and the other side of the carriage holds onto the tower, and no DOS, not like a koala bear. Over to the Florida Star Factory site, where the south side looks to be almost done with the south wall and the roof fully covered. The elevator part of the building also has an extension whose sole purpose seems to be, well, just to make it look pretty and so that the roof levels are exactly the same. Anyone who plays Kerbal knows aesthetics are important. Let's fly over to historic Launch Complex 39A, which one pad tells two very different stories. On the Starship side, the crane we thought was going to be reconfigured was actually just dismantled and is laying in pieces. Alex, you're fired for getting that one wrong on the last flyover. <laughs> just kidding. It could be they're planning on using it again and are just keeping the parts there, so there's no worry about it in Florida storms while they wait. This also tells us it may be a while until we see the quick disconnect arm and the orbital launch mount on the legs, as that crane is needed to install both of those parts. Also of note, the carriage system still isn't attached to the pulley system. All that's there is the cables that power the carriage system. On the other side of the pad, Falcon is keeping things busy. As we flew over, B-1073 was on the pad getting ready for its next flight. That was CRS-27, which sent a Cargo Dragon capsule to the ISS full of supplies and science. The next launch from 39A is another Falcon Heavy, except this one may look a little weird. It'll be the first ever fully expendable Falcon Heavy launching via Sat-3 Americas into geostationary orbit. Over at Pad 40 on the Space Force side, progress continues on the foundations for the crew access tower at Slick 40, with rebar now visible from webcast views and we can also see that during the flyover, cranes and personnel were very busy, even after a lot of recent launches. In fact, the transporter erector remains horizontal after the OneWeb 17 mission. All of this while preparations were underway for the upcoming SES 1819 launch. Speaking of the OneWeb 17 mission, that landed successfully at landing zone 1, which is where we're looking right now. After landing, the booster was raised, the legs were folded, and then, as we saw during this flyover, 
lowered horizontally so it could be sent for refurbishment. Now we do need to point out that this is only SpaceX's pad for now. Slick 13, the place where LZ-1 and LZ-2 are located, has been leased to Phantom Space and Via Space. In a statement to NASA spaceflight, Space Launch Delta 45 declared that, quote, as part of the SLD-45 allocation strategy, Phantom and Via Space will be the only users of Slick 13 once the real property arrangement is executed. Do you think SpaceX will lease another patch of land for new landing pads? Will they use existing launch pads to build additional landing pads on them and then land the boosters there? Let us know what you think in the comments down below. Looking at Port Canaveral, it's pretty empty, which is actually a good thing. That means the fleet is busy. A shortfall of Gravitas and Doug went out for the recovery of the CRS-27 booster. SpaceX pointed out on launch day that the recovery team for that mission was an all-female crew, which is likely a first. Just read the instructions went out for booster recovery operations ahead of the SES 1819 launch. At the time of this flyover, Bob was the only boat there, but it quickly went out for fairing recovery for that same mission. As for Dragon recovery vessels, Megan is up in the Carolinas for maintenance, and Shannon was on its way back to port with the Crew-5 capsule on board after a successful splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico, returning four people back to Earth from the ISS. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to get distracted. Talking about all of the new rocket construction at the Cape made me want to build my own, and that's possible thanks to today's video sponsor, Spaceflight Simulator. Spaceflight Simulator enables you to build and fly your very own rocket in the palm of your hand. Available in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store for free, you will be quickly building your own fully realistic rockets with rocket stages, realistic orbital mechanics, re-entry, and landing. Last time in the comments, many of you called me a noob. Let me prove you wrong while I talk more about the app. We're gonna go crazy this time. Not a single stick, we're going triple stick. Almost Delta IV heavy style, Falcon heavy style. Get ourselves stack separator. Gotta add a little checkerboard design because why not, right? Aesthetics are important too. Space Flight Simulator features a real solar system built to scale, real sized planets, and millions of kilometers to explore. It also has moons to land on too, which, how's that going? This makes it super easy for transfers. So, go into the moon, tap on the moon, navigate to, and boom, it already gives you where your transfer window starts and where you'll encounter it. Fly anywhere and do anything you like with Space Flight Simulator today for free. Go to nsf.live sfs or click the link in the description. Then just click on the link to download the app in your favorite app store. Start on your journey into the stars in your very own realistic rocket. Level out, land it on the moon. There we go, see? noob status, now to intermediate status, hopefully. I'm gonna work on getting this capsule back to Earth. So for now, I'll toss it over to Adrian with a look at what's happening at Blue Origin. Adrian? Thanks, this time we are able to provide you some really cool insight and news about how Blue Origin builds their own Starbase and works on full-fledged reusability. Starting at their Exploration Park campus, we were able to see a large collection of interesting hardware outside of the main building. Some of the things that are visible are transport stands, domes, a fairing crate and many more bits and pieces. It's always fun spotting hardware outside regardless of the company and what it will be used for. However, this isn't the only Blue Origin hardware we saw this flyover. Stay tuned. In the second stage tank cleaning and testing facility, or 2CAT, there is now what appears to be a stand inside of the building. It's possible that this is what New Glenn's second stage will be secured to while undergoing testing inside of this building. In fact, this stand looks very similar to the one that was used for testing the New Glenn Stage 1 qualification test tank in the TCAT, 2CAT's big sibling. To the south, the Reef Pathfinder building continues to take shape as it gains its roof, doors and windows. Right next to it is the vertical assembly area. This interesting structure, which we spoke about during our last flyover, is still a bit of a mystery. Though, we do enjoy watching these structures coming together and gaining more clues about what they'll be used for. 
Heading down to Launch Complex 36, the first thing that catches our eyes sits inside the doorway of Blue's massive hangar for New Glen. A truck with what appears to be one of the New Glen ferrying transport containers behind it. On the other side of the hangar, it's a very busy space. Several large trucks, lots of pieces of hardware and what appears to be three sets of SPMTs on the ramp. A bit further up is the testing area where Blue tested the first Project Jarvis test tank as well as a new gland second stage. There seems to be some activity happening around this tent. This could be a sign that we may see more tank testing in the near future. This also leads into our next topic. Remember earlier how I teased more Blue Origin hardware? Well, at the tents where Blue seems to be producing development tanks for Project Jarvis, we caught a steering being stacked. But that's not all. On the very west side of the tent, we can see this tank section. This could be the next tank to go through testing. Looking closely, there seems to be a small steel sphere near the top of the tank. Could this be a header tank for the reusable stage? It is great to see more hardware coming together from Blue Origin. At Launch Complex 16, Terran 1 is still seen vertical on the pad. Just in case you missed our coverage, Terran 1 had two launch windows in the last week or so. Sadly, there were multiple scrubs due to the wrong pressure in the second stage, propellant temperature, range violations and upper level winds. But don't worry, the next launch window is coming up soon. Stay tuned for our coverage of the next attempt and we wish the whole Relativity Space team the best of luck with their first flight. Now for a quick check-in on the progress at the launch and landing facility. Starting with Project Comet, we can see that there has been significant work since our last flight. The plot of land has continued to be cleared as well as gaining portable office buildings and retention ponds. Drilling for the foundation of the payload processing facility is also underway. We are still yet to hear who the customer is, but stay tuned for any updates. At the north end of the launch and landing facility, there continues to be more progress with the land clearing. This may not seem too exciting now, but as we've talked about before, Space Florida have big plans for the whole launch and landing facility to support the local space economy. Time to throw it back to Thomas to talk about what's inside the VAB, or as I prefer to call it, the VAB. North of the VAB, work has been underway for the past few months on preparing Mobile Launcher 1, used by the SLS rocket, for the upcoming Artemis 2 mission. While the mission is not expected to launch earlier than November 2024, work is needed to refurbish it from the Artemis 1 mission and also to modify its systems for use on Artemis 2, which will be the first to include crew. If you want to go over all of the details of this work, we have a fantastic article from our own Chris Gebhardt going over that. Click the link in the description below. That work is ongoing on what is called the West Park Site for the mobile launchers, and the second mobile launcher park site, the East Park Site, is currently empty. The interesting part of this is not that they aren't building anything, but rather that they are demolishing something somewhere else. That something is Mobile Launch Platform 3, or MLP3 for short. This platform dates back to the Apollo program and was then modified for shuttle, and after shuttle was retired, years later, its use was granted to Orbital ATK to launch the Omega rocket. But as many of you might know, Omega has been cancelled and so was the use of this platform. With no users for it, NASA has decided to mothball it. It had been in storage inside High Bay 2 inside the VAB and was planned to be mothballed precisely at that East Park site. But that's not where it actually went. It seems like demolition will now be taking place at the junction of the crawler way between launch complexes 39A and 39B, where old mobile launches for Saturn used to be parked. This raises hopes for the East Park site north of the VAB to be used for something else, specifically for Mobile Launcher 2, which is being designed and built for NASA's SLS Block 1B rocket, which will be used starting with the Artemis 4 mission. But all of that work is for missions later in the decade. At Launch Complex 39B right now, work is underway for Artemis 2, which is much closer to launch. Part of the work entails preparing the site for the emergency egress system that will be used by SLS crews in case of an emergency on the pad. The system will be similar to the slide wire basket design used for the shuttle and now SpaceX Crew Dragon flights. More info about all of this is in that article we have linked below. This week, we were also able to see ULA's Vulcan rocket out at Space Launch Complex 41. Vulcan was rolled back to its vertical integration facility due to poor weather right after completing a first stage tanking test. We can now see that Vulcan is back on the pad for another tanking test for the Centaur upper stage. A full stack wet dress rehearsal will follow that. Afterward, the ULA teams will perform a flight readiness firing or a static fire of the two BE-4 engines in a full countdown rehearsal to simulate a launch. The launch date for Vulcan was recently announced to be May 4th 
to follow Starliner's crew flight test on Atlas V. Just down the coast at Space Launch Complex 37B, the Delta IV Heavy rocket still sits stacked inside of its mobile service tower. Next up will be a wet dress rehearsal of that vehicle before its launch of the Enroll 68 mission. While there are a few new rockets getting close to flying really soon, such as Terran 1 and Vulcan, it was even more exciting to see on this flyover progress towards some of the future evolutions of super heavy lift rockets. Starship operations from here in Florida and upgrades for SLS are a big part of establishing a permanent human presence at the moon, and even more heavy lift reusable rockets like New Glenn will support all kinds of missions. Make sure you watch this space for updates on all the exciting stuff happening right here in Florida. Thanks again to Space Flight Simulator for sponsoring this video. Be sure to download the app for free by going to nsf.live sfs or by clicking the link in the description below. Until next time, check out our other videos and broadcasts here on the YouTube channel, listen to our podcasts, or visit us at nasaspaceflight.com. I'm Thomas Burkhart, signing off. Thanks for watching.